Well, first off, welcome everybody. We appreciate you getting online with us. So a little introduction of ourselves. I'm Judy Palmer. I'm the Forest Fuel Specialist on the Apache Sit Graves National Forest. And I'm Jim Pitts. I'm the civil culturist both on the Alpine and Springerville Ranger Districts. And I'm Pam Bostwick. I work out of the Forest Service Regional Office, uh, and I'm the Regional Field Specialist. All right, so we'll talk about the wallow fire in a minute, but first I just want to talk a little bit about some of the importance of documenting fuel treatment effectiveness and associated Forest Service direction on the subject. All right, so uh, an interim directive was issued last year in November, and it requires documentation of fuel treatment effectiveness whenever a wildfire starts in or burns into a fuel treatment that's been completed within the last 10 years. The Forest Service enters basic information into a database. The initial program direction for the Forest Service provides additional information relative to fuel treatment effectiveness documentation. It emphasizes the uh, 2000 uh, National Fire Plan to the present. All right, um, over the last 10 years, there have been occasions when wildfires have burned into fuel treatments, in effect, testing the fuel treatments. And so the documentation of fuel treatment effectiveness is important for several reasons. First of all, to validate that the treatments have been effective. Second, to provide baseline data from which to measure future improvements in the hazardous fuels reduction program. Third, to adjust treatment prescriptions. And then fourth, to share successes. Okay, we'll start off with just an initial sort of a little information on the fire. Weather conditions prior to the fire start, temperatures were around 60 degrees, RH is 22. Winds were southwest, which is common around here, 15 to 25, gusts to 40. We had gusts 60 to 70 on the Escadilla lookout, which is the picture on the screen. The fire was reported at about 1400 on May 29th, human caused, had extreme fire behavior with long range spotting up to three miles, rapid fire growth due to continuous red flag conditions, numerous days. It was hot, dry, and windy. The fire was located in the, on the Apache Sitgraves National Forest, started in the Bear Wallow Wilderness. We're located in East Central Arizona. Um, this bottom shows you where we're at on Arizona. You have to excuse my drawing skills. <laughs> Jim laughs at me. Um, up the top left-hand picture just gives you an idea of the smoke that was going on June 7th, and then to your right is just sort of a progression map. It's not the final progression map, but it demonstrates how the fire did some very long, rapid movements across the landscape in a day. It had a lot of long range spotting, which is evident. You can see the spot down by the arrow. Um, there were reports of spotting up to three miles. There were numerous types of fuel treatments that have been developed over the last years, and we're going to kind of go through those um, treatments based uh, on, the, on the communities that were impacted. The basic design of the treatments and the objective was to reduce the hazardous fuels, reduce the fire behavior potential, and basically to aid in fire suppression. Just to briefly touch on our mechanism to complete the work, um, the, our main tool was the White Mountain Stewardship Contract. Uh, the White Mountain Stewardship Contract is the first 10-year stewardship contract that was awarded by the Forest Service. It was awarded in 2004. It's a collaborative effort. It had a goal to treat about 150,000 acres over that 10-year period. Actual to-date numbers are 51,815 acres that have been treated. 
approximately 1.2 million tons of biomass have been removed off the Apache Sucres National Forest. And there are other contracts that we use outside of White Mountain stewardship that are more project specific, um, maybe mainly on a smaller scale. So we do use other alternatives besides the White Mountain stewardship also. This map just represents the locations of the treatments. Um, basically, the stuff that's in purple and green are treatments that were completed. The uh, pink and the blue colors, those are projects that are underway. And if you kind of look, there's a yellow or a cream colored. Um, those projects are the contracts and the projects outside of White Mountain Stew. And these are all basically stuff that's been done since 2004. And you can see the clusters are primarily around the communities of Alpine, Nutrioso, Greer, and then Springerville and Eager. So to focus a little bit more in, we're going to take a look at the, the map from the Alpine and the Nutrioso area. You can see our treatment placements. Um, Alpine is the one on the right, and then Nutrioso is kind of the center. And our, our treatments uh, at Nutrioso are on the southwest side. That's where we initiated our, our initial projects. There are projects planned for all the way around, as what you see over in Alpine. Uh, the purple and the green kind of surround the community of, um, of Alpine. One of the things to note here is also how the WUI definition has changed over time. Uh, the, the Alpine WUI was followed that strict definition of one half mile from the uh, private land. And as you look at the, the Nutrioso area, those treatments go out to oh, three to four miles outside of the private land. So that's under a different WUI definition. And if you kind of follow that progression, the, uh, the WUI definition was updated again in 2010. This one looks at um, the community of Greer and also Springerville and Eager. Again, the purple is, shows what's been completed. Uh, the yellow has also been completed. The green is projects that were underway as the, uh, during this past summer. The, um, the unique feature here is that a lot of this goes from high elevation mixed conifer all the way down to pinyon juniper, and there's treatments throughout. Um, the treatments also evolved in this project from a standard uh, spacing requirement to forest restoration over the uh, interim of, of the implementation. Uh, the fire really impacted the east side of Greer, and we're, we got that red highlight. And then uh, all of the stuff south of Springerville and Eager. So we'll jump in here. This is the alpine, uh, or one of the alpine treatments. The yellow lines are showing the treatment boundary, the treatment areas. Um, so within the treatment, so within the, this area are the treatment blocks. Uh, there's a little bit of a treatment block here. And then um, this, this area right here, is the is a buffer, and so it's just a, a buffer along a drainage. This was a standard alpine treatment, of, uh, 10 to 15 foot crown spacing. The treatments from the alpine started in 2004. They finished in 2010. The EA was signed in 2003. Um, another point, uh, this. Most of our projects all have the 16-inch cap, and the Alpine project has the 16-inch cap within it. This is a good picture from the standpoint of we get to see kind of what the fire had done uh, when it came into the treatment. Um, notice the, the tower, the communication towers. 
up on the, that left-hand side uh, where the arrow is. And we're going to use that as a reference point and a couple other photos, so just kind of keep your eye open for that. Uh, this was a wind-driven uh, crown fire as it came into Alpine. Um, it blew, basically this is the southwest side of Alpine, so the fire came in. When the fire hit the treatment, that's basically the first uh, yellow line from the top. That's the edge of the treatment. And then you can see it goes from a crown fire down to becoming a surface fire. We still had a lot of mortality within our treatment blocks. However, the, the objective of getting the fire on the ground was met, and the firefighters were able to engage. Below that yellow, the second yellow line, those are homes in basically neighborhoods and communities um, of Alpine itself. Um, there's really the combined effort of the fuels treatment with the efforts of the firefighters that were effective um, for stopping and reducing property loss in Alpine. This is uh, basically if you were up at the tower kind of looking back down to the northeast, so it's that same view but looking the other way kind of gives you a better perspective or another perspective of the Crown Fire. And then you have that belt of the treatment. Again, that's uh, one half mile outside of the boundary of private land. And that is basically brown. A lot of mortality, still a lot of heat that was absorbed from the Crown Fire. And then uh, the neighborhood and the, the private land is where it's really dark and green and still very dense and thick. One, one thing to note on this is on the day it moved into Alpine, the fire had made a 12-mile run on this day with real windy conditions. You want to talk about one? And then another note on this Alpine treatment with the crown spacing of 10 to 15 feet, with FVS and FFE modeling, we're showing that really that treatment longevity is only about 10 years. So here's a home. Then take a look. You can see the arrow points at the tower. To give you a reference, this is a picture from within the neighborhood looking to the southwest. Uh, you can see the effects being a surface fire on the ground. It did burn through the, uh, the community, the neighborhood there. One of the things that's uh, important to, to point out is many homeowners in uh, Alpine were involved in FireWise workshops and had um, taken FireWise principles both not only in the construction of metal roofs, good siding, but just in the basic principles of cleaning up your yard, um, having your wood pile removed from the, the adjacent to the home and that sort of thing. And also some landowners have done fuel reduction projects actually thinning trees on their property, um, removing uh, pine needles and that type of de degree. Um, one quick, I saw some chatter going on. All of the communities we're going to talk about are covered under a CWPP. We have numerous CWPPs on our forest um, for the Apache and the Navajo County and Greenlee County. So this drops over to the north of Alpine and to the Nutrioso. Uh, the Nutrioso environmental assessment was completed in 2006. The treatments were initiated in 2007 and were ongoing uh, and were occurring at the time of the fire. These treatments were designed with a 15 to 20 foot crown spacing to promote uh, basic treatment longevity and increase the overall effectiveness of the treatment. So it's a, a little bit of a, a deviation from Alpine and some of the lessons that were learned when we were implementing Alpine. So here's a view of basically the southwest side of Nutrioso. Again, it has the same setup as Alpine with a ridge and mixed conifer forest to the south and, and southwest side. The um, wind-driven crown fire uh, came into the treatment area. So if you look from the right towards the left, that first uh, yellow line, yep, that's within the treatment area. This is greater than one half mile outside uh, the boundaries of the private land and also up above on the ridge um, to, the, to the right of the photo, that ground had also been treated. However, this treatment um, was still 
very effective from the standpoint of, again, the crown fire came out of the, the crowns, dropped to a surface fire, and the private land boundary is that kind of the yellow line in the center of the picture and going back to your left. So the um, firefighters were able to engage and protect uh, those homes and that private property and the values at risk there. And now we're moving over to Greer, and we'll talk about the Greer treatments. The Greer NEPA was completed in 2004. Uh, the prescriptions that were developed were basically targeted towards the 50 BA residual target, and that tied directly with the Apache County CWPP. Um, the Apache County CWPP also identified the WUI boundary, and so the project area followed that, that WUI boundary, which was greater than one half mile uh, outside of the private lands. Basically, you know, 50 BA, you're looking at a, like a 20 to 30 foot bowl spacing and um, treatment of the ladder fuels. The treatments began in 2005, and all the White Mountain stewardship planned acres, basically those acres that could be mechanically thinned and harvested um, by equipment, were completed in 2010. Other thinning contracts are still occurring within that area. Uh, one of the unique things about the Greer project, since it did start in uh, 2004, is that there were changes in the treatments and the types of treatments evolved over time. The next two pictures are just a brief overview of what it looked like as, it, as the fire approached Greer. This is near an uh, area we're going to talk about treatments called Amberian Point. This was the flaming front as it came down the east fork of the Little Colorado River, which is near Amberian. Um, this gives you an idea of what you're looking at at noon in Greer. That's the same area. Um, and this is uh, the Amberian Point project. This was not done under White Mountain stewardship. This is one of the other contracting mechanisms that we used. Um, the forest has an IDIQ contract in place, so we're able to pick up these small acreages with um, some dollars that, are, that we may get allocated through the fuels program. This project was about 17 acres in size. Uh, the primary thing here was to build a defensible space. This is really steep ground. It um, is directly adjacent to the private lands. There's residences. Can you point to that? There's residences in this um, area right there where Judy's circling, and uh, and also businesses. And then you can also see the other rooftops down in the valley in the in the open meadow there. And the idea being that um, up at the top of the ridge, that area up here and going back to the south uh, in the photo had already been treated under White Mountain stewardship. So we kind of just had this little space that was treatable with hand crews. And um, like I say, it was about 17 acres in size. We really focused on removing the ladder fuels. Uh, we only could cut trees up to about 12 inches in diameter because trees larger than that, we physically just could not move with a hand crew, just too heavy. And the idea of being try to break up that canopy where you had some, uh, could create some gaps. And this ultimately provided an anchor point for the ground forces with support of the aerial resources to do a, conduct a burnout and do a protection, basically tie the two drainages together there south of Greer. Just another example of um, extreme fire behavior as the fire moved into Greer. So th this is a picture on the east side of Greer, and um, that previous photo, that extreme fire behavior, that's exactly the type of fire behavior that we had up on the ridge, um, basically at the top of the photo. The White Mount stewardship treatments that were done um, parallel the base of that ridge at the toe of the slope. We treated right up to the slope break at 40%, and then we treated back to, uh, down slope towards the residences there and provided that, uh, that fire buffer, that fuel break. These types of this treatment here was uh, had a target of 50 BA. The um, 
It was a 16-inch cap, so our residual basal area was higher than 50 for the most part. Ultimately, you were looking at about a 24 to 20 foot, 28 foot uh, bowl spacing. And the unique thing here is the community assistance grants that played a factor, especially from the suppression side and the options that it, it uh, provided the firefighters. The Greer Fire Department has been very active over the last few years uh, working to um, receive and put in for these grants to help homeowners. Um, thin trees and clear the brush out around their houses. And this neighborhood here um, has been very active, as you can see, as a result of this, this photograph. And I know the, the picture kind of looks like our White Mountain stewardship treatments may be a little bit more dense than what is right there at the homes, but it's more of just an optical illusion due to the slope and the way that the angle of the, the photograph is. But the, um, the Greer Fire Department, they follow the CWPP from the standpoint of the 50 BA residual target. Um, they don't have to work within a diameter cap, so they do work with the homeowners directly, and they help identify which trees should be cut, which trees should be left, and they also double check and authorize uh, reimbursement to those landowners. So they administer the grant, and they follow up and make sure the work is done correctly. And with the work that was done in this neighborhood in combination with the White Mountain stewardship treatments, that allowed the firefighters to engage this fire basically about at the forest boundary and um, protected this neighborhood quite well. So here's the arrow points down, down slope, um, so Greer's down in the valley, and this, this picture shows the White Mountain stewardship treatment that's up on top of the rim basically above Greer, and the the unique feature here that we want to point out is that not only do your treatments or our treatments in this circumstance provide protection from the community, but the way that they are laid out, they become strategic uh, places for suppression actions. So in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see that there's a, a major dirt road that's a forest road, and that became a fire line. And, um, our treatment basically allowed them to do the burnout from the road, and it carried through our treatments. And if you want to go to the next slide. So this is kind of a view back to the north of that same treatment. Um, you can see Greer on the right-hand side, upper right-hand corner. And there is a red arrow there, and that points to a hand line that basically tied in to the south of Greer over to the Amberian Point, the photograph that we were talking about in that project. So this really anchored that uh, southwest corner of the fire, and our treatments allowed that uh, suppression tactic to basically take place and be effective, and they were able to hold the fire um, from doing any more further advancement to the west using these treatments and uh, a back burn. This picture was taken the day the fire came into Greer in one of our treatment areas, and it just, it, it's a good example of the surface fire behavior and the low intensity that we had in some of the treatment areas after the fire was able to drop down from the ground. Um, another picture within Greer that just demonstrates the abilities of the firefighters to safely engage in direct attack and burnout operations adjacent to homes. Um, you know, it demonstrates that we need the need for both fuels treatment and firefighters to protect homes and values at risk. Now we're going to look at some of the, the treatments to the south of Eager and Springerville. Um, the, the yellow arrow points to, to Springerville. It's covered in smoke there. But that smoke column is a good representation from the standpoint of the, the amount of wind. Uh, you can see there's not much rise in that smoke. It's just completely laid over due to the wind. The NEPA in Eager South was completed in 2006, and the treatments were focused around fire and fuels objectives being met through forest restoration principles, and it had a, with a strong wildlife component emphasis in there. So here's um, kind of the, 
pre and post mechanical treatment and a post wallow fire picture. So the, the top left hand, um, and you got a red circle that kind of focuses on a tree, and that's the same tree all throughout. So that's the kind of conditions that we were working with um, pre pre mechanical treatment. And then immediately after the mechanical treatment uh, on the upper right hand corner, the slash hadn't been burned at that point in time, so you still see the residual slash. Uh, we did get most of the slash all burned in that project. And then the wall of fire impacts um, in that center photograph there at the bottom. Here's another example, um, basically the same type of strategy. These, uh, these photos are coming from our White Mountain Stewardship uh, monitoring plots. We have uh, systematic grid uh, monitoring plots that are permanent plots within these treatments so we can monitor them throughout time. These photos, what I really want to point out here is, is more of that stand structure. Well, we kind of started with a, a real group clump um, stand structure, and that was one of our focuses we wanted to maintain and, and keep as part of the stand. So we, we did thin, we did remove trees within uh, those groups, um, but we really tried to isolate those canopies so that you'd have a gap, a genuine gap between the canopies. And this photo shows from the standpoint of the fire behavior, well, if you don't have canopies that are touching and you don't have canopies where a crown fire can go from one tree group to the next tree group, um, then you don't have a crown fire. And yet fire comes to the ground, you have a service fire, we had um, acceptable fire effects on, on the most of this ground. The, um, the treatment handled uh, a direct blow of the wall of fire being high winds, erratic fire behavior, and they, they pulled through. They survived quite well. That's it for our presentation. A few things, you know, we wanted to discuss is, you know, it takes firefighter efforts co coupled with the fuel treatments to protect values at risk. Um, our treatments in these areas have evolved over the last eight years to especially promote longevity. Um, one thing on the Eager South was looking at the modeling, the longevity and effectiveness of that treatment is in excess of 40 years according to the models. Um, and then homeowners who are implementing FireWise principles, you know, aided in protecting the homes. Anything else you guys wanted to? It's a really a strong combination of all those efforts. Uh, I think without any one factor, it may have turned out to be a different outcome. Uh, the, the firefighters and their efforts were huge, but they couldn't have done it without the fuels treatments that were done right adjacent on the, on the federal lands and even within uh, the private lands and some of the things that the homeowners themselves have done. And there's examples where homeowners didn't do anything and homes were lost. There's examples where we still had adequate fuel treatments around and we still even lost some homes. So it's a real combination of effort um, to make it a success. Well, thank you guys. That's a great presentation. It's, it's really interesting to see the, the detailed inspection of fire behavior interacting with those treatments. Um, let's, we'll, we'll go through some of these questions and in a second I'll unmute the line. Uh, one question came in about the cost per acre of mechanical treatments. Jim, do you have a sense of what the range was across those uh, White Mountain Stewardship projects? Yeah, the range goes from about $169 per acre all the way up to about $925 per acre. Our average was about $468 per acre. Great, and, and I see uh, Paul Sommerfeld just uh, typed in a question asking if uh, you noted any fire behavior and or post-fire differences between those areas where the slash was still on the ground and those areas where the slash had been removed? Yes, yeah. yes. Where we didn't get slash removed, it was total mortality. It's not that we had a crown fire through there because we had done a significant amount of thinning to where it wouldn't support crown fire, but those fuel loadings still in place uh, was extreme amount of intense heat 
and it basically baked the canopies of those residual trees. So we still had a lot of mortality within those areas that had slash on the ground. Yeah, was we have a good slash spot. generally piled, or was it uh, more of a lop and scatter in those areas? We, we have the, the pleasure to have both experiences. So we had uh, quite a few piles on the ground, and at least where you had piles, you had your mortality was concentrated usually around the landings or adjacent, immediately adjacent to those um, piles. Where we had the lop and scatter, it's 100% total mortality. So we did have, in fact, the, the lop and scatter was cut last in March, and the fire burned in uh, May, so it got there, truthfully, it got there the first part of June, but um, so it was red needle slash. And uh, some other questions, uh, Sharon asked about the difference between the, the treatments with a 10-year longevity or, or model longevity and those with a almost or greater than 40-year longevity. Can you guys talk about how you achieve that, that longer lifespan of treatments? The main thing that we've got to achieve is the variable stand structure. The, um, the stuff that, like at Alpine, where we've only got about a 10-year window of those, those treatments to be sustainable and be effective um, from the standpoint of a, a fuel break is because the amount of growth that you'll get on those trees in that 10-year period, you basically will break back to having crown closure. And so it's important to have gaps between those, those canopies, and if you want to sustain those gaps, then it needs to be greater than 10 feet. Uh, what we have on Eager South is they actually range anywhere from about 30 to 60 feet between those, um, those trees. So it's just about physically impossible to have, um, you know, the crown closure again within a 10-year window, especially. The, um, the idea between the groups is that the group structure provides fundamental needs for different wildlife species. And so if we kind of isolate these groups, they will act independently as a fire moves through. Some may torch because they have ladder fuels within, or they're a younger group, some, some won't torch. But the main point is that even if they do torch, they can't ignite the next group and create a sustained uh, crown fire condition. So it's really a, a basic principle of separating out your groups and kind of defining that space, how much space is really required from one group, one canopy group to the next. And, and that, that spacing partly comes from modeling, the uh, FES and the FFE extension? You know, you, got to, you can use the modeling as, as a tool to help. Uh, FFE or FVS doesn't handle groups. So the best thing that um, I think anybody could do, my recommendation is grab some folks that have a lot of experience, and front, mainly from the fire and fuel standpoint, and walk through these stands and look at it, and you'll get a feel for if a crown fire is sustainable or not. And one of the other big things is how big do your groups need to be? How big can they be or how big should they be? Um, there's a lot of discussion within the wildlife shop of how much habitat is needed to support different types of wildlife species. And that all needs to be balanced out. But if you're really still trying to prevent crown fire and keep uh, basically a mixed fire severity or surface fire, then you're going to have to have gaps in the canopy. Great. Now, um, there are some questions that came in about the, um, uh, the, the structures themselves, and Mark was asking earlier about the structures that were ignited um, from embers versus uh, flame contact. Uh, do you guys have any sense, I guess in these communities, were structures lost? Yeah, I think a total of 32 structures were lost in four commercial residences. I, I wouldn't say I have a good feel of that. Would you, Jim? No, I'd say that anything that was possible to happen happened. So if it did, any variable or scenario you could think of, it happened. 
Okay. There, there's examples of you know even a low sur low intensity surface fire that came through, um, basically carried by the needles. It got into somebody's porch. They had a wooden porch, and the house became fully involved. Um, then there's great examples in Greer along that East Fork drainage where um, there's that fire intensity, that fireball, as one of the, the photos showed there in Greer. You know, a flame in front like that hit the house. There's not much that anybody's going to do about it. So when you have um, you know, 100 to 150 foot wall of flame and 40 mile an hour winds behind it, the house becomes fuel just like everything else around it. Yeah, I mean, we had everything from direct flame to amber cause, amber cause to later, yeah. even after the fire had gone through. But one of the, I think one of the more, it's not, it wasn't a residence, but it was a historical cabin, a historical structure uh, out in the middle of the grassland. Nobody really gave it much second thought that, um, that anything would happen to it, and the grass around it didn't burn, but the cabin burned to the ground. So obviously that was an ember that they got into that cabin, but you know it's it's hard to say. A fire kind of does what it wants to do. Yeah, and there was, a, I mean, along with residents and the commercial buildings, there was also like 36 out buildings and one vehicle lost that I know of. I think there was some more questions. Yeah, there was one question that came in about the 16-inch cap, and. Um, and, and Andy Egan was wondering if that had an effect on the effectiveness of treatments. You know, the 16-inch cap, especially from the standpoint of longevity, that's where it has its biggest implication. Um, I think in, in my world, the 16-inch cap really just drives you to be more creative and try to be more flexible. It's not a one-size-fits-all type prescription. And you have to definitely be more on the ground and more in tune with, with what you're trying to do there. But the main point is that if you are investing you know, several hundred dollars per acre to do this type of treatment and you have a 16-inch cap, your longevity on that investment is pretty short in return. That's great. I, I, I really like your comment about creativity because I think uh, certainly here in New Mexico we live with a de facto cap and um, I like the attitude that it promotes creativity rather than a full stop. Uh, Alice Margolis put in a question about um, any of the treated areas that had large, let's see, um, low severity fire and treatment areas, any treatment areas that had large areas of high severity fire. Um, so what might, looking back, what might you have done differently in those treated areas that had ended up with high severity fire? Uh, I'm I'm trying to, I think one of the areas we saw some high severity was where there were residual piles still. So the, the treatments aren't complete until the piles, the slash is gone or, you know. I'm trying to think if there was any other areas you... The only other thing that was an eye-opener for a lot of us was yeah. the, the topography, the oh. features of the topography and how that influenced not only the fire but then the direction of the radiant heat. And you know, we, you design a treatment not only to be a fuel break but to, to be green after a fire so that you still have a forest. Yeah, you know, that's kind of your idea, that's your intent, but when you have untreated slopes of mixed conifer or that have heavy fuel loadings, um, the radiant heat that those put off, I think a lot of us underestimate, and the, the intense of that heat basically it still kills the canopy. You'll have a low intensity surface fire that may burn through, but you're going to have, um, some places we've got it up to about a quarter mile, 200 yards is, you know, into the treatment area, and um, you, you've got this heat impulse that is, you know, not only from like the wind-driven side of the fire that comes into your treatment, but also from that, um, from those untreated slopes or untreated pockets that will cause mortality within your treatment. So even though it burned, low intensity, low severity type of a burn, that heat impulse still killed a lot of the trees within our treatment areas. 
I'm going to unmute all the participants and maybe uh, Sharon, maybe you want to ask your your question uh, just over the phone line. Okay, sure thing. I was wondering uh, if there was any contrast in watershed effects in the wooey areas or the non in the non wooey areas since there was more intensive treatments in the wooey. Yeah, so I mean, those treatments in the wooies and the watershed impacts are, um, I would say, acceptable from the standpoint of you still have canopy, uh, the, especially after the, the monsoons hit, the grasses responded great. Um, the understory was still intact, so you still had that um, hydrologic function that could, could take, take place and recover quite rapidly. Whereas in those areas that were untreated and we had high intensity, high severity fires, not only do you have a lot of runoff, but you don't have that um, understory still intact. So there's nothing there. There's no vegetation. There's to hold the soil. And uh, the watershed impacts were, I mean, just drastic. The, um, not to mention the amount of bear work that had to be done and the cost associated with that. Um, to try to protect the, the values at risk downstream because of the flooding that was in place. So you kind of, it's, it's a little bit of a trade-off, you know, from the standpoint of you don't want to, there may be some restrictions on treating steep slopes or treating all of the watershed. Well, when it burns, you're still going to be paying that 1000 to 1200 bucks an acre. Um, it's just going to come in in the fact that it's a bare treatment with aerial mulching and aerial seeding. So you were talking about untreated areas. What about treated areas that were outside of the wooly that maybe didn't have as intense of a treatment? How did they hold up? They, I need any, all of our treatments held up well. Uh -huh. They, all the treatments, whether they were inside or outside the wooly, were still um, very effective from the standpoint of we had a surface fire. And some of them had more of a mosaic burn a little bit more mixed severity because of the types of treatments that were done and the idea of leaving some pockets untreated and then treating around them and um, you know we've had we had some areas that were about 20 acres in size that um, were not treated basically you left a whole stand untreated well we lost that whole stand but then all the way around it we still had it, where it was treated it was green low intensity low severity fire we also had some areas that were old burns that had a mix of effects also. Some burned very low intensity and a few of them still burned depending on the age of them and how long they've been there or how the fire hit them. So we also had that effect. Yeah, some of, the, some of our worst fire effects were seen in uh, the Thomas fire. Was it um, how when that burned? Oh, 2006. I don't remember. But it it um, it was in you know steep slopes, uh, heavy timber when it burned. So it it, it was a real mix of verity fire, uh, and a lot of um, all that stuff had had that was killed from that fire was on the ground. So our fuel surface loadings were really high. When the Waldo fire got into that, it definitely it slowed the progression down significantly, but our fire effects were at the high to extreme point where we lost most of our residual stand of timber that was that made it through the, the, the first Thomas fire. And um, just because of the, the fire effects on that dead and down and the intense heat and uh, that was created. And on the other end you have the Paradise fire which was last two, summer. Last summer. And the effects there? Our, Minimal, yeah. you know, and it, it's granted it's one year out, but we didn't lose any a significant or even a real portion of additional trees out of that fire, and it's, but again, it's one year old. So I think we had, a, we had a mix on that. The sticks hadn't fallen yet, so there wasn't the fuel on the ground. Is that why that was less intense? There's, that's a portion of it. It's very, yeah, but there's also just not the fine fuels there built up again to, to really carry that fire through, to, you know, to carry the wall of fire back through the Paradise Fire. Uh-huh. And if you look at some of the older, like, 
logging contracts or stuff around the 26 road and that area. I mean, there was there was definitely some older treatments that had a huge effect and had low intensity fire. You know, the fire just came around them <laughs> and avoided them. Yeah, I think the map shows real clearly the Horton timber sale yeah. um, area where where the fire had to move around it. It forms like a horseshoe shape around that, and you can see it real well on the uh, fire progression maps. So that had a big effect on fire behavior. Yep. And when when Horton was done, what was the intention of that treatment? So the Horton timber sale, um, this was. It was planned in 97. Um, most of it was cut out by 99. The, um, the intent was seed tree cuts on the ridge tops. And they also got coated also as, uh, as fuel breaks, but their initial intent was, um, was seed tree cuts. In 2007, um, 2006 and 2007, they did some prescribed burning in there. And, and that showed to be real, fairly successful from the standpoint of what they were trying to achieve was we did get a lot of regen and they wanted to, to kill back that regen using fire and they did that. And then when the fire, when the wallow fire hit it, it pretty much slowed down to almost stopped it in its tracks and like say on the progression fire you can definitely see the, um, the fire having to work around those treatment blocks. and. Um, of the Horton timber sale. Sounds perfect. Let's do more of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Are there other questions out there? Questions that uh, came up in the chat that we've we've moved beyond that people want to reiterate? Actually, I have a question in terms of going forward. So, what's the plan going forward with with some of these areas? I mean. What are, what are the conditions in areas that didn't burn high severity? Are they, are they, have they essentially been treated now? Can we, can we go ahead and, and, and just reintroduce fire to those areas now? That's definitely what's on the table. Like I say, the, those areas that were low to moderate severity burns, they got a first treatment. You know, as long as we can maintain, uh, especially our pine stands within the wall of fire, a lot of them came through really well. What didn't come through so well is anything with mixed conifer components. Um, and, and most of those were on slopes, and so they really took it hard. Um, what's going to happen there, you know, just normal succession and um, maybe some, some work to, to help that along. Your, your, hands, your, your options are pretty limited on those steep slopes. A lot of rocks, shallow soils. Um, the best thing that could happen is we could get some aspen to regenerate and come back in those areas. And, uh, but you know, you're right, those areas with the low to moderate, that's the first entry, that's our first treatment. We just need to keep it going. This is Karen Machado in Montana. Um, how did the communities react um, before the fire and then after the fire? I, you know, White Mountain Stew was done pretty collaborative. We'd had the rodeo Cheddar Sky. For the most part, the communities before were very supportive of the treatments. And we, I know a lot of the silviculturists tried to involve the private landowners as they were treating right next to their properties. Um, we've had, I think, really good support from our fire departments and our homeowner associations. You know, on the most, on the, in the big picture. Um. Yeah, and I'd say one of the greatest things about treating the wooies is it brings forestry back to the people. So where you didn't, you know, in the old days, your timber sales were in the back 40. They were, had shelter breaks between the roads so people didn't see what was going on. Well, this brought forestry and the needs right to the, the property line, right to their back door. They got to see what we were doing. It, um, they were involved. They asked questions. They'd call. Uh, it spurred a lot to do um, treatments on their own land and try to, to help out that situation. And it's an excellent support from the fire departments and all the communities. They're definitely involved. 
the the interesting thing, you know, you when you go through a big fire, you know, we saw the same thing on the rodeo cheddar sky. You um, when the firefighters are here, the public is very supportive, and everything is great. They've, you've got a lot of camaraderie. There's neighbors helping neighbors. Um, once the smoke settled, that's when you started to see a different side of people. That's when people are very angry. You know, their their forest burned up. Um, a lot of the news shots, you know, in the media, they show the worst case scenario versus kind of the mosaic burns that may have happened or some of the green areas. Um, we have Big Lake Recreation Area that was right in the middle of the Wallow Fire that crews, there's over 200 firefighters that were stationed there at one time during the fire. Not only was it a spike camp, but we needed to protect that facility. And after the fire, people kind of wrote it off. They said it's all burned. There had to be a media campaign to basically say that you know Big Lake didn't burn, the marina was still there, the store is still there, the campground is still there. Um, it, it, would, it really transitioned from um, you know, kind of how the communities reacted was there was a lot of anger initially, and then there, you have to go through that grieving process. It's, it's no different than, uh, than really a family member or a close friend that may have passed away. We saw the same types of things, and we're still working through those with a lot of the communities and people within the community. Um, it's going to be a long ordeal before this is really kind of closed back up and getting people back out in the woods so that they could see their forest was a priority of the forest. Um, that was to try to start that healing process. The other aspect is you know, getting the hiking trails open, getting things open for the hunting seasons. And there's management reasons from the land standpoint to have the hunting seasons as well as um, not only that, just to get the people back out into the forest and try to get that healing. Um, we got to work on a lot of our relationships with these folks because people are mad about the fire. And I, I think it's only a natural process and we have to work on our relationships and bring people back to the table and bring those communities along with what the next steps are going to be because if we do want to manage with fire in some of these locations, we're going to have to have their support. And um, we may have got the first treatment done, but without the community support and the public support, we're not going to be able to move forward. I, I can tell you, we had a meeting last week. There's about 350 acres, I think, of piles to be burned right next to Greer that weren't consumed in the Wallow Fire. And it was local homeowners and it was very supportive, actually, of wanting to, yeah, we need to get those treated. We want you to do that. We want you to do it when it's the right time. And even other folks that live further out of the Greer area were like, hey, we've got piles here, too. Can you treat them? So they were still supportive of putting smoke back in the air. You know, that was just a small group, though. We'll see once we start implementing more in the area. Well, I think on that note, um, we'll wrap it up, try to keep it within the hour. But I really appreciate uh, the three of you. It was a great presentation and uh, provided a lot of good insight into this fire and, and the, the treatments that you've been working on for decades. Um, so the, I'll send out an email uh, probably tomorrow with a recording of this. So if you know someone who missed the presentation but could benefit from it, they'll be able to uh, uh, listen and watch the PowerPoint via the recording. And uh, you'll all be on the, the list so that when we do announcements for upcoming webinars, you can participate in those too. So thanks again to the presenters. And uh, I'm going to shut off the phone line and shut down the webinar. Um, and so hopefully we'll, we'll all be on another webinar soon. Thank you. Thank you. you.